Howdy, folks. Time for Matinee 75. Yeah. Now, we did not get to the movie theater this week. No, coronavirus, man. No, not because of coronavirus, because nothing new started. That's why. Let me, let me at least. We've seen everything that we've seen everything that, other than Brahms, but I don't really care about saying that. I've been sick for a couple weeks. I even got cough drops in my mouth, so you gotta excuse me because you know my sinuses and everything. Yeah, that's what I got. That COVID. She doesn't believe me, but you don't have COVID. I got it. I got it. Well, because. If, if you had COVID, I would have it too, because you've had the shit for like... Let me fucking fantasize. <laughs> Why Let would you want to fantasize about having a disease? It makes it more exciting. Okay, I guess. <laughs> like he's, I'm a part of something. He's, <laughs> he's still waiting for the zombie apocalypse. Wait, wait, he can't, he I'm can't, fucking he ready for zombie apocalypse. can't wait for that shit to happen. Re- I've been preparing for zombie so apocalypse weird. for years. <laughs> Some people just uh, want the world to end for some be, whatever reason. I'm going to be proven to be a genius one of these days. You're going to see. <laughs> okay. You say, "Damn, Tom, you were right. You were right." <laughs> That'll be the day. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So well, <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. Okay. So we didn't go to the movie theater, like I said, not because of coronavirus, but because nothing Should've really new started. Yeah. Well, you oh, did but, that. All oh, right. But that's not why. Okay. So uh, we saw some shit. In our very own home. One of them was on Netflix, one of them was on Shudder, and one of them we bought on Blu ray. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking color out of space. Yeah, we're going to talk about that we'll one. Talk that about was an excellent one flick. God, it was so good. If you don't have that one, go ahead and go ahead and buy it. <laughs> yeah. So the first one we're going to talk about is a new one that came out on Netflix called Girl on the Third Floor. Now, this was the, I believe, directorial debut of a guy named Travis Stevens. Now, the main guy who was in this, I didn't realize it when I was watching. Um, his name is uh, CM Punk, and he's actually an MMA fighter. So I believe this is his first acting role. Now, he is very... I couldn't decide while I was watching the movie. I guess, like, the more I thought about it, the more I was like, okay, I, I see where, where he was going with that. Um, while I was watching the movie, I couldn't decide. I'm like, he's either like a really bad actor or he's, or this is like a black comedy. Now I'm leaning more toward black comedy because he comes off very much like Bruce Campbell. And if they ever make a biopic of Bruce Campbell, this dude should definitely, well, I mean, Bruce Campbell can still play Bruce Campbell in a biopic of Bruce Campbell. But if somehow he wasn't available, this guy could totally do it because he has the same facial expressions, the same type of voice, the same everything, yeah, like my, the same mannerisms. My impression was that the tone they were going for was kind of like Evil Dead. It and, was. And, and, it was Evil Dead yeah. meets Cronenberg. Yeah. Because there was like some kind of weird shit going on with the house, like the house bleeding and stuff. Yeah. So and you could tell, you know, he's not really taking it seriously and you're not really taking it seriously, but it's, they're just, they're entertaining you. And that's kind of the old school way we used to watch horror movies. I loved Evil Dead. Yeah, I, did I didn't too. take it seriously, even though it scared me. Yeah, you know what I mean. It was weird because you know, oh, but then you kind of you laugh it off, oh, and then you keep watching. <laughs> you know, oh, now this one, I mean, this movie, Girl on the Third Floor, it's not as it's not as zany as Evil Dead. Like, yeah. don't don't get me wrong, but it's it's kind of in that same spirit. It's a very you know Sam Raimi type of yeah. spirit, I guess. Even though I don't know if I'd overtly call it a black comedy, but it does have some like some comedic. Yeah. And, like some dry comedic elements to it. So basically the setup is that um, this guy, uh, played by CM Punk, that's not his real name, obviously, but that's like his MMA fighter name. So he plays this guy named Don. Now, I suppose, I think he had been a lawyer um, in Chicago, and he somehow fucked up, like he, um, he like fucked his clients out of a lot of money or something like Like he got in trouble. And um, he is also a fuck up in other ways. Like he was, he's a recovering alcoholic. It's like he cheated on his wife and all this other kind of crap. So he's kind of like, um, they buy this house kind of out in the country or out in the suburbs rather. And he's going to renovate it because his wife is pregnant and he's like, okay, we're going to start all over. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop whoring around and you know, I'm going to get another job and I'm just going to fix this house up and everything will be perfect. So he has gone to this house and he's going to fix it up all by himself with no help from anybody except his little dog, Cooper. And that's how he's somehow going to, like, heal his relationship, I guess, or kind of get his shit back together. But that's not how it works out. Because it turns out this house is kind of haunted, but in a weird sort of way. It's like it kind of all starts where he's in the house and... 
this girl turns up who says that she's the neighbor and she basically just turns up in the backyard and she was like oh i live around here and this house has always been abandoned so i was just kind of hung out and he's like uh okay let's fuck you know pretty much and i'm like immediately it's like he's trying to be better but he's already as soon as he's at the house by himself he starts drinking again he starts screwing around again but it turns out that this girl you know it's a trap because i was saying dude it's a trap well clearly yeah it's like as soon as i saw her i go nope yeah nope I mean, some women don't do that. Right, nope. right. Some beautiful random woman turns up in your yeah. backyard and is like, "Oh yeah, I it. just hang out," and, and she's basically just throwing herself at him. She's and he's just a like, spy. "Oh, okay." She's either a spy. <laughs> she's either some kind of spy or she's a cop, and they're investigating you, or you know, or she's trying to steal from you. It's not normal. That's what I mean. Not but normal. he falls for it like a yeah. dumbass. Well, that's kind yeah. of the whole point of his character he is a sympathetic character but he's also a fuck up and that becomes abundantly clear the interesting thing about this so like i said as it goes on like the house just starts doing weirder and weirder shit like all of the um like the outlets start like oozing um various fluids um sometimes he's knocking holes in the walls like to tear a wall down or something that looks like pulsating organs or like blood or something like that back then. so the house is kind of like alive now he befriends this woman who's like a pastor at the church like across the street and she tells him or he finds out some that the house used to be like a brothel like an illegal brothel the interesting thing about this movie is that yes you could say it's like a standard haunted house movie but it's not like a haunted house movie in the sense that, you know how most haunted house movies are like, oh, something bad happened there in the past and it's like still hanging around. This one almost kind of has, yes, it has that aspect, but apparently everybody that lives in the house don't experience the haunting. It was because him being a fuck up in the present is almost kind of like waking it up. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's a little bit like The Shining in that way where it's like, you know, he's kind of like, you know, his character is weak and he, so he's vulnerable. So the house is kind of like coming back to life, like to take advantage yeah. of his character weakness, Which basically. Kind of, in a way that's also kind of like Evil Dead. It is out, kind of, Going yeah. out to the cabin and being in the cabin, un, you know, unlock some stuff from the Necronomicon, you know. Yeah. They're just trying to come up with something to show you a scary movie. Yeah, and yeah. I the thing that I liked about this one is that it had like a really interesting like a interesting premise it also had like an like a bit of surrealism like going on in it too which i thought was kind of cool i really liked the the aspect of like the house almost like an organism you know where i mean literally where there's like it seemed like there was organs and shit like that behind the yeah. It had pretty good special effects. Like it did, it. actually. And I don't yeah. think this movie was all that expensive. Yeah. Um, and as I said, this guy's... Um, this uh, Apparently, this is his first movie. The house that they used, that's a real house. And I guess that he had bought that house like to use as the headquarters for his production company. And it was being renovated... And he's like, don't finish renovating it because we're going to make this movie in here because that was part of the plot was that this house was being renovated. So a lot of good um, horror franchises kind of started it off that way. You know, the guy guy who did Phantasm. Yeah. You know. Don Coscarelli. Yeah, just kind of make his own movie and just made a bunch of them. Well, I feel like horror, I mean, I guess all genres, but horror in particular, since that's what I'm most familiar with, it does seem to be better when it's just the vision of one person or a small yeah. group of people. Yeah, it doesn't work out when it's a committee. When you do horror by committee, yeah. it doesn't work out so good. Then you just kind of get these bland, like, yeah. jump scary type crap that's just forgettable, you They're know? They're kind of best when they're mid to low budget works of from the heart really yeah you know, when people that really like the genre right. or really love the genre and want to do something with it yeah especially um, if especially if you're starring in it kind of deal yeah you know? <laughs> i noticed that those are actually get written a lot better i think it's because the guy who's producing it directing it and starring in it and involved in it he's kind of making a manifestation of his his dreams and his ego yeah so it turns out to be it's better because he cares yeah you know. Well, everything's always better if it's just like a small group of people and they yeah. really, really want to do this and this right. is their vision yeah. than if it's just a bunch of faceless people going, well, we need to check these boxes off to make X amount of money. 
back, yeah. you know, it's always uh, going to yeah, be better. Yeah, you want a ghost? Put a ghost in there. Oh, you want a werewolf? Put a werewolf in <laughs> The kids will love it. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah, Cha-ching. you don't want that going on. Yeah, well, even though, I mean, I guess that model's successful, too, because like that people guy, do go see those, but... Like that director who commented on the review that we did, this is a couple years back, the one about the crazy-ass crack, remember that? Where they were uh, doing the weird drugs and seeing the monsters? That was a long time ago. That was a good movie. I want yeah. to see that one again. I can't remember which one you're talking about. It was a crack that they were doing? Yeah, they were doing that crazy crack and seeing aliens. Crazy crack. Oh, um... Welcome to Willits. What? Welcome to Willits. It wasn't crack. It what was, was it? Um, some. It was meth or meth. Some kind of weird weed or something yeah. like some kind of hybrid. Yeah, and it was putting him in contact with evil aliens, wasn't it? They were, um, or were they the undead? It's, I'd like to see it again. I liked that movie. No, I don't think there. Actually, I don't even remember if there were any aliens. They just they thought just, they were aliens. Right. They were hallucinating. Them. <laughs> they were hallucinating the aliens. But it didn't matter because you're seeing them. Yeah. You're seeing them as, <laughs> as you're watching the movie, so you, you know. So, yeah, uh, so this is on Netflix, like I said. It seems like, um, I don't think it got a theatrical release. It did play at a whole bunch of uh, film festivals and seemed to have gotten really uh, positive reviews. Like I said, it's not, you know, the best movie I ever saw, like, but it has, like, a really cool, like, uh, vision to it. So I'm really interested to see what this uh, director does next because this was a very interesting movie, and I suggest that you... Okay, second movie we saw this week. I've been looking forward to this one for a really long time. H.P. Lovecraft's Color Out of Space with Nicolas Cage. Excellent movie. We ordered it on Blu-ray. We pre-ordered it, and it showed up in good condition. Had a slip cover on it. Wasn't Steelbook, but didn't really have to be. Excellent movie. Same same basic kind of team that did Mandy, wasn't it? It was the same production same team, production. which is Spectre Vision. That's like a production company that, uh, that actor Elijah Wood... Um, founded as far as yeah. i know like him and a couple other people um so yeah this it's is a, a, it's a work of greatness kind of like mandy it's just a different it's a lovecraft story. it's not quite as crazy as not mandy as crazy. like yeah. it has like a more grounded story to still it pretty i guess fucking cool, though. but it's still really cool about a farm about this family that's on this farm they actually mo- moved there from the city it was like an ancestral farm and uh meteor lands in the backyard and it's some kind of weird color. It's some kind of alien thing. Gets in the damn groundwater. Starts affecting all the animals and bugs. Drives them crazy. Does mutates them. It's alien, whatever it is. And it's and it's alive. And I don't. Is it one of them or is it like a collective? It's hard to tell. Huh? I don't think there's any way. I mean, this is kind of one of those. I mean, obviously, Lovecraft is very very difficult to. Um, adapt to film just yeah. because so much of his stuff is like unnameable and undescribable yeah. and all this other stuff so i don't really know if you know is there a distinction because it's so alien and we wouldn't understand it is there even like a distinction between an individual alien and right. like a collective of aliens or is it just like a, a vast intelligence that off the top the movie kind of reminded me of prince of darkness but a prince of by, but, but a, a prince, good, a good but one. a good one one time right <laughs> You mix kind of like Prince of Darkness in with The Thing. Carpenter, two Carpenter Because this has some very Thing-esque. Yeah. But it kind of, in some ways, kind of feels a little bit like Mandy because you got Nicolas Cage just being crazy as fuck through the whole thing. Or through most as of he it. does. He's just fucking... He's a national treasure. And I know, I well, know what I, I know what I did He's a fucking there. crazy person. <laughs> and uh, all kinds of cool shit happens in it. Good special effects. Shot real well. Good script. And there's going to be more of them. Dude who made it is talking about doing um, a Dunwich horror, and that's going to be fucking awesome. He wants to do a trilogy. Um, Fucking man. I hope he does In the Mountains of Madness, too. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if Guillermo del Toro still has the rights to do that. Oh, yeah, the rights to it. That's been what? Although it's all in public domain. I guess anybody could make their own. Yeah. That's been in, like, development. He said that eight, nine years ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. I've been wanting to see that, though. But, yeah, so Richard Stanley, who wrote and directed this, he did the adaptation. He's been a big Lovecraft fan forever. Now, Richard Stanley, he did um, Hardware... And he did uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau, where he very famously was fired from it. That was back in 1996. I actually liked that movie. Now, they made a whole documentary about that called Lost Souls, which used to be on Shudder, but I didn't get a chance to watch it. And then when I checked yesterday, it wasn't there anymore. 
Um, but so this guy, he's kind of like a mad genius. So it's like, so he hasn't directed a movie no. since 1996. Yeah, in, in the in the bonus features, he's saying, I reclaim my director's chair. Yeah. He's this crazy fucking goth dude with like a long black hair and a little goatee. It's so epic. Goatee, you know what I mean? And he's in his goth clothes living out in fucking an- in some ancient part in France up in damn yeah. mountains with <laughs> castles and shit. Yeah. I reclaim my director's chair. He's and a cool dude. A, yeah, and apparently um, him and his mom, like he said, his mom used to read H.P. Lovecraft stories to him when he mm-hmm. was a kid. And then he said that, you know, when his mom got cancer later on, that he would read the stories to her, like when she was convalescing. And the reason that um, Jolie Richardson's character in Color Out of Space um, is recovering from a mastectomy, like from breast cancer. And the reason that he put that in there was like as an homage to his mom, because his mom was the one that kind of instilled the love of Lovecraft into him when he was little. So he's been wanting to do this. And like I said, he he has talked about wanting to do the Dunwich Horror next. And he wants to do another movie after that too, but I'm not sure which one. A lot of uh, cool shit in the Dunwich Horror. It is, yeah. I would love to see that d- done by this director. I hope Nicolas Cage is in it. I hope Nicolas Cage is in all of them. Yeah. Nicolas Cage should be in all movies. The, the director <laughs> said that Nicolas Cage gave him gave him belief in American Hollywood actors again. So yeah. they rekindled his belief that you could have an actor that really cared about what they were doing, were, t- were talented, and were fucking crazy. Fucking Nick Cage is fucking crazy. He's he crazy. is, but he in, a a good, way. in a good way. Yeah, he, he, in a fun way. Revs himself up, and you can see some behind-the-scenes shots where he fucking revving himself up into insanity to do these to, to do the to do these performances. And he, it's like Mandy. He was fucking Mandy, knocked yeah. her apart, and fucking Mandy. We actually and we it, actually watched Mandy again, like after yeah. we watched this one, so we could like compare those the two. two movies. These two movies can stand side by side. Mandy, though, is kind of like a the way it's shot and the tone is kind of like a. Frank Frazetta painting on acid. Yeah. Happening in the early 80s. That's what it's like. Or late 70s stuff bleeding on into it and everything. So imagine, it's like something out of damn heavy metal magazine. Remember heavy yeah. metal comic book? It's like that, kind of. This one is uh, just as good, but the tone's a lot different. You're dealing with uh, sci fi. Sci-fi horror. This one has a lot more humor in it too. Yeah, yeah. And not all of it comes from Nicolas Cage because some, like some of the kids, um, you know, the three kids that are in it, which I thought was funny. They named the daughter Lavinia, which is a character from the Dunwich Horror, Lavinia Whaley. Yeah. So, uh, so he's kind of like trying to get in on that, you know, ahead of time. But there's, uh, you know, there's a lot more like with the son being kind of like, uh, you know, a stoner, and then like the daughter being like a Wiccan, and then. Nicholas Cage wanting to move this family out to this farm, I guess because, um, you know, his wife has had cancer and they're trying to, like, move away from the city and stuff. And he has decided that he's going to, like, grow vegetables and also raise alpacas because yeah. they're the animal of the future. But he thought people ate alpacas. <laughs> <laughs> Does it, I mean, I'm sure people eat alpacas if there's nothing else around. No. But I feel like they usually milk alpacas or ride them. No, you make sweaters or out. Or make sweaters out makes, of them. They're pack out. animals, right? It's like making wool. Yeah, it's a pack animal. Yeah. You, you can get wool off them. But the funny thing about it, I was like, I was watching a review of this, but like on some other channel, and somebody in the comments said that I never knew that I needed to see Nicolas Cage milking an alpaca. Yeah. But now that I'm happy that I, yeah. that I fucking saw <laughs> the movie's got real good special effects. Um, there's mutated insect-looking things. Uh, some of it's practical effects. Some of it's CG. The color from outer space, which you have to see it to understand it. It was like some kind of weird... It was a meteor first, but then somehow it channeled down lightning bolts. And there was also kind of like this weird magenta color that came down with it. Some kind of life force, life energy. Yeah, Alien like it kind of like energy. leeches into the ground and into the water and stuff right. like that because you can hear like Tommy Chong who is in this as like kind of like a stoner character named Ezra yeah. who lives on their like on this little thing on their property and he's kind of like listening to them so you can hear like kind of these weird like alien voices yeah. like under the ground and stuff. Yeah, and it's leeching into things and drawing the life out of stuff and trying to transform the fucking trying to transform the the, at least this plate that part of earth into into wherever it came from 
there's some kind of an extra dimensional element. It's not clearly defined, and that's just the way it is in the book. But that's the way it is in the yeah. story. I mean, in the story, the, obviously they had to, um, you know, because the story is quite short. Um, but they, so in the story, like, you know, the, the surveyor guy is coming there and talking to this dude who lives on the property, who's kind of like the Ezra character that, in the movie. And he's telling about what happened to the Gardner family, like, many years ago. This one, it's, you know, the the timeline is very uh, truncated. So, because it happens over, like, a pretty short period of time. They move to this farm, the, you know, the asteroid or the meteor lands. And then everything starts to happen, like, really quickly. Like, they start all start going insane. Like, the tomatoes come up, like, all deformed. Like, the alpacas go ape shit and like you know some thing like stuff happens um some thing like stuff happens to some members of the family as well um and everything is kind of like bathed in this and the, like the little kid i think is uh he's actually played by the little kid that was in uh haunting of hill house now that's the kid with the big glasses and he starts like saying there's a man down in the well like somebody down in the well is like talking to him. so all this mysterious shit starts to happen yeah and um at, at first i think he thinks the little kid at least thinks the color is like really beautiful. Like they yeah. all seem to think it's like, cause it is super cool yeah. looking when it comes in the wood, it's like this pink and purple. And yeah. Don't want to spoil this movie though. No, this, no. This, it's streaming now. They're streaming it off of um, YouTube. Yeah. You could probably find it in other places. I'd recommend it on, on Blu-ray. If you're, if you liked Mandy, if you're a fan of Mandy, you will love this movie. Yeah. It's not, well, like I said, if you it's, like Lovecraft movies. This is yeah. one of the best, if not right. the best, Lovecraft adaptations. Right up there with From Beyond, uh, the Reanimator series, um, the one with the, the Jeffrey Combs type, yeah. uh, uh, movies. You know what I mean? They're they're like that. It, it, it's actually better than those, and, and it's a lot more. Uh, the quality's higher. It looks a lot better. And it, um, it really seems, I mean... I think it's it, probably closer to the original story. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it is changed some. They do have, like, a surveyor character that comes there, and they are building a hydroelectric electric dam, which um, I think in the original story they were going to uh, flood the shit and, like, make a reservoir out of it, you know, implying that the water was going to be poisoned, so everybody that drank out of it was going to... You know what I mean? Even yeah. though they didn't go... So they do go into that, um, but they're basically... In the story, it's the surveyor talking to the guy that lived on the property about the shit that happened to the family like a long time ago whereas in the movie it's brought to the present day like you're yeah. seeing what's happening to the gardener family this is definitely as good as dagon yeah and th this and is Dagon's a very a good one Dagon's yeah good. this is obviously a lot more sci-fi right. oriented than that it's like i've seen some people compare it to like annihilation but it's in visually at least yeah. um the same cinematographer that did this also did i am mother which we reviewed a while back yeah, that, that was a, good movie that was like a really that good sci-fi movie too that's yeah. on uh, still on netflix yeah, i think if you want to check the, that one out it's the subject matter that's different you're not dealing with sea gods or or you know cthulhu or anything like that you're dealing with uh, some kind of an alien force and uh that's really what makes the story different from dagon it's a different topic yeah but because it's a different it's a, it's a different creature. The situation's different, but it's just it to me. I liked it as much as Dagon. I did too. It's a totally yeah. different kind of thing, even though it's both Lovecrafty and obviously, but like I said, it's more cosmic than yeah. Kind of like remember in Creep Show the one the one where the guys get eaten eaten by the moss. Yeah. What, what was the name of that? Uh, Lonesome that, Death of Jordy Barrel. Yeah, that's a very short story. This is kind of like a very high end version of that. And I think Stephen King. Because Color yeah. Out of Space was Stephen King's, as far as I can remember, was his favorite Lovecraft story. Mm -hmm. So I think that when he wrote Lonesome Death of That's Jordy Barrel, I think that he was that that was like his riff on it. Okay, yeah, um, Makes because sense. because I've heard like in Dance Macabre he talked about that story quite a bit, right? Makes and how sense. much he liked it. So yeah, so definitely so this is the story that inspired that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you can see it like with the alien weed and everything like that, and coming from the meteor. Because when right. when we were watching Color Out of Space and the meteor landed, the first I had to restrain myself from saying meteor shit <laughs> right. from fucking creep show because I know that that's like where that inspired from. But yeah, so definitely, definitely, this seems to be getting. It got like a very brief theatrical release because I know that um, some of the channels, like horror channels I watched, they had seen it in the theater. I think it only played in like 80 theaters in the U.S. And Hollywood. I think it played in a few in the U.K. as well because I saw some British reviewers that had seen it in the theater. 
Hollywood politics. Hollywood kept it out. They didn't want to compete with their movies. How much you want to bet? I feel like a lot of movies don't get a wide theatrical. I think it's just because they don't think it's going to make any money. I don't believe so. I think which they, is dumb because this movie and Mandy, I think, would have done better at the box office than a lot of the fucking shitty horror movies we've been seeing lately. Yeah, probably. It, yeah, that's the sad it didn't thing. Have is like these. To do with, it did, I think it has to do with who makes them and who their friends are and what it, how deep they are in the scene. And these are kind of independent films, and they don't want them in there competing with the money. They don't. Uh, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. That's just what I'm thinking. I think it's business. I think part well, of the, yeah, part of the Hollywood business is to keep competitors out of your damn theaters. Yeah. Gotta be. I would do it, so they must be doing it. Yeah. But like yeah. I said, this did get a limited theatrical release, you know, not yeah. just not just at uh, festivals and stuff. It actually did play in some theaters in some bigger cities um, in this country and it, maybe in other places in Europe, too. I'm not sure. But I know that it played in some theaters in the UK. This would have kicked ass in the theaters. if it had I been feel like a lot. And I kind of wish that I'd gotten to yeah. see it on the big screen because I'm sure it looked amazing. If this had been promoted rights. And sent into the theaters, it would have done well. So would have Mandy. Mandy would have done real fucking well. I yeah. would also love to see that. Yeah, on the imagine you saw Mandy in Dolby. Yeah. Dolby Theater. Somebody, Bye. you know what? Here in Orlando, we have like a like a little indie theater. Well, it's yeah, it's been there like forever. Called the Enzian. I wonder would they ever do? They should do a Nicolas Cage double feature. They should do this and Mandy. <laughs> Mandy yeah. Be, I would be first in line for that shit. We, oh. watched, we watched them back to back, and it we was did, yeah. awesome, yeah. Because I really would really love to see them on the big screen. I mean, these definitely yeah. need to be seen on the big screen. Now, if he comes out with um, Dumb, Dumb Witch Horror, Horror, and it's in the same vein as those, same level of quality, which I, I'm pretty sure it will be, and if it's got Nicolas Cage in it, I'm hoping for Nicolas Cage, <laughs> fucking Dumb Witch Horror will be knocked out of the park. Yeah, I'm so, I'm excited. I'm excited to. See, I hope. I really do hope that he can get like. Because that's a creepy story. Honestly, I don't know how much this costs to make. I couldn't really find like a good figure of how much this costs to make. I'm. It was very low budget. I'm sure, but it doesn't look like it at all. Through most of the Dunwich Horror books, the monsters are kind of invisible. They're made yeah. visible at the very end, so you can fight them. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. And like I said, yeah. I'm pulling for you, Richard Stanley. Seriously, yeah, yeah. do yeah, a Kickstarter or something. Get some more Lovecraft yeah. shit going. Yeah, you need. To we get will the, watch it. <laughs> you need to get the fans together. Get a Kickstarter. Raise the money. Make the fucking movie, man. Yeah, we're there. And then, uh, you know, for a certain amount of money, like uh, I'd give you know, I'd give you the money for for Blu-ray up front for the uh, for a pre-sale, and that's where the money could come from. Yeah. Because we bought this on pre-sale. Yep. How much was it? I don't even remember. Probably about 20 bucks. I huh? think it was 20 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, we, we ordered it like before it came out. Yeah, and it came put out that on, shit up on February Kicks. 25th. I would hook up with Ethan Van Skyver because they've been doing that. They did, they did the Expendables, the, the new Expendable, excuse me. Yeah, the Expendables Go to Hell comic book. They raised like a hundred something thousand dollars just in a few weeks. Yeah. And um, Spencer Stallone was involved in that. So there's got to be something going on kind of like, kind of like what, what, what Van Skyver is doing. Because, you know, I mean, they're trying to bring good movies and comics back. You know, independent stuff. Well, like I said, it's kind of like... It's, it's a lot... kind of restrictive, man. Well, it's a lot better nowadays yeah. because look how, one, it's a lot cheaper to make movies. Yeah. And two, there's so many more, like, options. You yeah. don't, like, have to go the big studio route. You don't even have to go to, like... Even back in the 70s, you had to go to, like, grindhouse theaters and stuff like that. Yeah. You don't have to do that anymore. The you can just go straight route. to fucking... Yeah. VOD, there's all kind of different like options that you go have. straight to your fans. They'll fucking pay you. Yeah. Because the big, the, the yeah, old crowdsourcing, man. Yeah, the old fashioned studio way, man. You know, it's too corrupt. Let's be honest, man. Well, and they, you know, they want, they want to, to see money. a return on their, you know, investment. And a lot of times, they kind of want to make these big yeah. tentpole type movies for hundred yeah. million dollars, which right. means that now you have to make three hundred million for that movie to even yeah. break even. And a lot of those movies are okay, but they're not really all that great. Well, well, they have huge overheads, and they have fucking mansions and pools to pay to pay for, and you know what I mean. They have to cover the losses that they made with the other movies that fucking bombed. Yeah. They're, it's too expensive. Why do that when you can just make the movie you want to make? You don't have to worry about paying off the shit that failed. Yeah. And paying off fucking every Tom, Dick, and Harry to do this. But you know, that's jobs. why I was so happy that Universal actually made fucking The Invisible Man for $7 million. Yeah. And it was, it was fucking great. Good movie. I yeah. said, see, you don't need to fucking... And it made you don't need to make a mummy movie for $200 million of Tom nah. Cruise. We don't want to see that shit. Yeah, and... and make it, a good movie for $7 million. Yeah, and it made three times its money back within a few days, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, because it's a good fucking movie. 
less is more nowadays. You don't need all that fucking That's CGI. That's what I mean. With I mean, CG, we've seen it. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, you can do everything you with CGI. Great script. Don't, it's a crutch. A great script. Raw sub- subject matter that's true to the original source material. Great actors. Tell a good fucking story. That's all it takes. Yeah. You doesn't have to. You don't need a bunch of money, a bunch of shit. Fucking practical effects. You know, it's good, but you don't need to. You need to spend fucking millions and millions of dollars on CG. You don't. No. Yeah. I mean, the Color Out of Nobody Space a had a little bit of CG in it. It was just enough. But it was. It wasn't like overbearing. It yeah. was just kind of like a little bit like an insect or something like that. And, and it had a lot of. Itself and, and it had a lot of practical effects yeah. as well, like a lot of the kind yeah. of creature effects and stuff. Well, were practical, practical effects enhanced by some CG, which right. is the way really. That, That's what you should do. You know the thing, 2012. You know, like the yeah. thing remake. It was better looking than that, if you ask me. That's the yeah. way the Thing remake should have looked. Yeah. I think they beat the Thing remake. Because some of the CG in the thing, thing remake didn't look... I mean, it was good for a day, but it just didn't really look right. Like I said, I they would rather... They wanted to do it practical, and they, and they, and they, yeah. and they fucked that up. The, the studio didn't want to I mean, practical, practical effects always look better. Um, and practical effects, if you if you must use CGI just like to enhance the practical yeah, effects, just do did. minimal. It's a mixture. Minimal. Yeah. Don't make a whole fucking creature out of CGI though, because yeah, that doesn't just, doesn't move. It still right. never looks right. It doesn't look like it have. It doesn't Even look, nowadays, it doesn't look like it has any weight. It but really everything doesn't. that they showed in this movie was spot on. Yeah, they everything. Show us a whole, and like I said, I'm sure it didn't have a huge budget. I don't no. know what the budget and it was. Is, and it wasn't like a, a monster, a monster a minute type movie. It showed you just enough. Yeah, it wasn't too much. I liked it. I did too. I mean, so it's, it's visually amazing. Yeah. It was just like a really fun, story. just a really good adaptation, a very close adaptation of the story. It was modernized, obviously. Yeah. But only yeah, seen it once we're gonna see it again. Yeah, I definitely want to uh, watch it again. But yeah, this is one that you should definitely buy on Blu-ray. Yeah. Um, you know. Support this shit. Maybe he'll make more Lovecraft movies if we're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully Nicolas Cage will be in there acting like a crazy person. Yeah. <laughs> and milking alpacas. <laughs> yeah. Okay, third movie we saw this week just dropped on Shudder. Now, the weird thing, from what I could determine when I was researching this movie... I think this movie was actually made in 2017, but it didn't get a wide release on VOD until late last year, like late 2019. And Shudder just added it a few days ago, and Shudder has it listed as a 2019 movie, so I said, well, that's fair enough. That's still kind of new. Uh, And I needed a third movie for the show, so I decided to go ahead and watch it. This movie is called Replace. Yeah. Now, the guy that directed it, um, Norbert or Nortbert Kiel, I believe he's German. And this is his first. He had made like a couple of other movies in Germany. Um, and I believe this was shot in German to, Germany, too. Um, but it's in English. And uh, probably the biggest draw of this is Barbara Crampton, isn't yeah. it, you guys? She's got to be in her late 50s, man. She's still hot, man. She looks cute. Yeah. She looks real cute. She looks great in this. She plays like kind of like a mad scientist type of character. Not a mad scientist, but like a creepy scientist. If you don't know who that is, she was the one that was uh, played in a lot of the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, H.P. Lovecraft movies. Yeah, Stuart Gordon, yeah. He He was in Reanimator. She was in Reanimator. She was in From Beyond. And she was that fucking hot blonde. Yeah. Running and she's still acting dinner. nowadays. It's like, I was really yeah. surprised to see her in this. She was in a movie called Beyond the Gates. She was in yeah. uh, the latest uh, season of Channel Zero. Uh, kind of briefly. She was in yeah. a couple of episodes for that. But yeah, so she's in... And you know what's weird is like, just like probably an hour before we recorded the show. Because I, I follow uh, Barbara Crampton on Instagram. And I just saw that she just finished shooting a movie, um, which I guess is a horror movie, called Jacob's Wife. And that movie was directed by Travis Stevens, who's the same guy that directed Girl on the Third Floor. So I was like, okay. woo, all three movies are connected this week, and I didn't even mean to do that. Wow. But yeah, so this movie, Replace, it's basically, it's kind of uh, a little Cronenbergian. Um, one thing that I will say, it's like, if you really like um, stuff like uh, The Neon Demon or The Perfection or perfect or some of these movies that have this kind of like retro wave 
aesthetic. Like the lighting in this and the score in this yeah, is very like really really cool. Like I fucking loved the score of this. A lot of movie. new retro wave music in it. Yeah, definitely. There's a, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. So that whole like um kind of aesthetic is like super cool. A lot of like neon lighting and stuff. Um, so the basic story is about this girl and her name is um, Kira Mabin. And as the story goes on, you discover that she is, one, suffering from memory lapses. Two, she's also suffering from this strange skin condition, which is kind of like it starts on her hand and then it starts to spread. It's almost like her skin is getting like really crusty, like aging prematurely. Almost kind of like eczema. Yeah, <laughs> like really, really bad. Yeah. So as the story goes on, you kind of figure, she figures out that, um, that the only way that she can like restore her skin is basically like taking other people's, yeah. <laughs> and, like cutting other people's skin off and like sticking it on there. And then it like kind of stays in there. So th I really actually, I liked this movie, but it took me a while to get into it because yeah. I think what, it's weird because this movie, um, when I was saying that all these three movies were linked together, because this movie was, the director co-wrote it. The other writer was Richard Stanley, the same guy that directed Color Out of Space. So he co-wrote this movie. Now, the only thing that I wish they had kind of started it somewhere different because... I think it took me about 15, 20 minutes to, like, to catch the wave of the movie yeah. because they started out where... Her character is having um, memory lapses, which factors into the story later on. But because, you know, she's at the beginning, she's talking to this guy, she takes this guy home, and then, like, she wakes up, he's gone, and then she leaves the apartment, like, going back to her house, but then she's there, but then her house is that guy's house, and she can't figure out, and she keeps, like, hearing people in her apartment, she doesn't know who they are. So it takes a while for that to pay off, so I was kind of, like, confused for, like, what the fuck is yeah. going on? Like, I get that she has the skin thing and she's going to the doctor. And there's kind of all this stuff where Barbara Crampton plays the doctor. And she's kind of, like, telling her, yeah, we need to do this and that and the other. But but Kira doesn't remember some things. Yeah. And so I feel like I know that they were trying to make it that you were just as confused as the, as the character, like, trying to put, your, put you in her shoes. But I think that I wish that they had started a little bit yeah. in a different spot because it took me a while. But once I got into the movie, I really got into it. Yeah, you, you're calling it right. <clears throat> I mean, it violated that 10, 15 minute rule I have. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, I, if I'm not hooked up into the movie, if I'm not into it in, within 5, 10, 15 minutes, I'm never going to be. And that's kind of what happened. Um, I stopped paying attention to it because... Uh, it's kind of like, you know, once you lose the suspension of disbelief, you, you no longer can enjoy the movie. Once, it's kind of like that for me. If I can't get into it in that first 10, 15 minutes, I start to reject the movie for some reason. Just the way my, my mind works. So I start ignoring it. So I started looking down at my tablet and getting lost in that. And every now and then I'd look up and the movie was getting better, but by that time I didn't care. It's because yes. it was too slow. Well, it's just, it, it wasn't even, I don't, the beginning wasn't slow. It's just that I wasn't sure what was it. going on. Right. But then like after about 15 or 20 minutes when all the threads started coming together and I was like, oh, okay, I, I yeah. see like where they were going with it. And then it started getting really good. And um, yeah, so this kind I'm, of. I'm very impatient and intolerant. Yeah. If, I, if, if I'm confused for too long, like five minutes or so. I just go, ah, fuck you. Well, and no, because like I said, you know, I'm willing to, and we were talking about this um, earlier when we were talking about Assault on Precinct 13, yeah. where I, I think sometimes when you watch a movie, you're like fighting it. Yeah. Whereas I don't, I don't fight it. I just watch it. Yeah. I mean, it takes a lot for me to turn a movie off. Like I will usually, right. you know, give it a chance to do what it's going to do. Well, that's what's so good about our show because you can write stories. You're, you're a professional author. I'm just Joe Blow. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm going to be the average motherfucker that's just sitting in a theater. Who, what guy who supposedly bought the ticket. Okay. There's more of me than there are of you in that theater. Unfortunately. I guarantee you. Okay? <laughs> so I can predict how, how well movie's going to go because I understand the lowest common denominator. I understand them. I understand it too. I you just... understand them because, you know, I, I can relate to it. So... <laughs> You know. But yeah, like I said, so... You can't get too fancy with me, or you can't get too, uh, uh, 
like you can't get too vague you can't get too confusing you can't be too slow there's there's kind of like a but the thing is is i don't like it real shallow either like i like you know i can watch a marvel movie and go yeah big fucking deal and then forget it instantly well i forget a lot of the marvel yeah. ones too well I'll, because i kind of enjoy it like it's damn right or like a roller coaster ride but then the credits roll and i can't tell i couldn't tell you what i saw yeah i don't remember a lot of them yeah. like i enjoyed them at the time but they don't like stick with yeah. me yeah and I know other people aren't, aren't aren't like that. Like a lot of people really dig them, and that's cool. But it's like I said, I enjoy them at the time, but I don't. But that wasn't them. the case of Color Out of Space. Well, yeah, that kind that of that was like, over, and I I remembered it. Yeah. Yeah. So. This one, like I said, even though it started out, like I said, not necessarily slow, but kind of like I wasn't really sure what was happening. And then this, like you know, she has this neighbor that keeps coming over that seems like really um, insistent that she keeps like coming over to the house and stuff. And I was just like, what the fuck is going on with that chick? She's weird, and all this other kind of stuff. But as it goes on and all of the plot threads start to come together and there are actually two really big kind of plot twists in this that I didn't really see coming uh, that have to do not only with the neighbor that keeps coming over, but also with her skin condition and what it is, where it came from, uh, what Barbara Crampton is up to. Uh, so, you know, what I'm not going to spoil her or anything like that, but there are like two kind of big revelations in there that I didn't really see coming. And so if you, this is kind of like the type of movie where, it gave me a little bit of a vibe like that one we reviewed a while back, like Bliss, but I liked this a lot better because it's there was a lot more story to this one where Bliss was just kind of like everyone hanging out in clubs and drinking blood and stuff. This one actually had a story and a progression and a, you know, a plot twist that came around like at the end of the second act and stuff like that. So it had more of a narrative thrust yeah. than Bliss did. The look was kind of similar. Um, but I think the look of it reminded me more of that weird, like, sci-fi one, Perfect. But again, this one actually had a story, whereas Perfect sort of did, but it was just very kind of, like, nebulous. Yeah. And this one had, it, even though this one takes a while to go get where it's going, but once I got to the end, I was like, okay, I know why they did that, because they were playing yeah. with the whole idea of her memory lapse and you find out why she has those memory lapses like later on and then it makes sense so this is kind of one where i feel like probably a second viewing would you know i would probably appreciate it more in the second viewing i really it's not really gory but there are some kind of cronenbergian i mean this is about a girl who is killing people and cutting off bits of their skin and like sticking it on herself so mm. if that sounds like it's going to gross you out then it'll probably gross you out but it's not you know, it's not the most, like, graphic shit I've ever seen. Yeah. You know what I mean? There is a little bit of, like, icky type of... For me, the 10, 15-minute rule still played out. Usually, if I can't hook up in the 10, in that first 10, 15 minutes, I'm not going to like the movie. As the, the movie did get better as it went on, but I could tell by what was going on. I wouldn't have really liked the movie much anyway. It's it's. I would say it's a very female movie. Um, it's mostly women. They're mostly cute. They're mostly having sex with each other. Which some guys might get into that, but I just well, and a lot of the a lot of the theme of it too is that yeah. you know women try like being afraid of getting old. Yeah. Um. So that's kind of like a theme too. Yeah. I also liked um kind of the the ending scene where Barbara Crampton was doing what she was doing. I really felt like that was an homage to Dead Ringers. I could be wrong about that. Yeah. But just the way they kind of shot it and yeah. like the color scheme and stuff like that kind of reminded me very much of that. This did have a little bit of a Cronenbergian vibe to it, but kind of cross reference through new retro wave kind of arty sort of horror. I think that first 15 minutes could be re-edited and it would be better for the general audience, I'm thinking. It might be, yeah. Because like Before I said, even I was just better. kind of like, yeah. like I was kind of interested, but I'm like, what is, I, like, what yeah. is going on? But then after, Some like I said. Some of the dialogue's kind of blocky, kind of, eh. Guys don't really talk that way. You know what I mean? That, that kind of stuff. I wondered if it was dubbed because, and when I, when, like I said, when I was watching the, um, the credits, it yeah. seemed like I, I don't know if it was shot in Germany, but it was like funded German. And I believe that the director is German. Um, so I'm wondering maybe they if they talk that way in Germany. But. Well, no, I mean, maybe they did like, um, they used to do back in Italy in the day where it's like, everybody would just like talk in their own accents and then they would just dub everybody over later. I'm not really sure if that's what happened. I mean, obviously Barbara Crampton wasn't dubbed cause that was her real voice, but, uh, I'm not sure about the other actors because apparently it's like some of the other actors kind of sounded like they were dubbed. Maybe it was just like ADR and it was their own voices. I don't know. But yeah, so it's on uh shutter. If you want to check it out, if you're like into like kind of arty Cronenbergian type of horror sort of filtered through an eighties 
new retro wave aesthetic. And if you liked stuff like the Neon Demon or the Perfection or something like that, this kind of reminded me that it was in that kind of vein. So uh, it's on Shutter. It's probably streaming other places too. Uh, so check it out if you feel.